Okay, my friends. Welcome to. Okay. Oh. Good morning. Welcome, everybody, to uh, the atomic bomb and the end of World War II. Uh, those of you here in person, of course, you know that you should have signed in and you should turn off your cell phones. Oh, you're getting so much better at this. Uh, and hello to everybody out there on Zoom. I'm so glad, uh, hopefully, uh, that I can't see you, but uh, hopefully <laughs> you're enjoying this class as well. And we have had no technical difficulties today, so we are off on time, which is quite good. Well, today we're going to finally talk about the atomic bomb. I know that you thought maybe I was never going to get there, but we have gotten there now. And so we're going to talk about the atomic bomb. We're going to talk about the making of the bomb, not the use of the bomb. And we're also, as promised when I started this class, we will talk about the movie Oppenheimer. Well, a couple of disclaimers. The first disclaimer is, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> the second disclaimer is, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a chemist, and I'm certainly not a physicist. But I'm going to do my best to make sure that you can understand how the bomb is made and how it works. And that's the first piece. The other thing that people that know me realize is I am fascinated with how technology has changed the world so quickly. Uh, when we look at the world in 1760, before the first Industrial Revolution, to today, now that we are if had the second Industrial Revolution, of course, what we call today the Information Age, the could be the third Industrial Revolution, you want to call it that, that fascinates me. And I'll give you an example, a military example of how this technology has gone so quickly. In 1926, Robert Goddard will create the first rocket engine, liquid-fueled rocket engine, 26. 18 years later, the Germans are using intermediate-range ballistic missiles, the V-2, to bombard London and, of course, Antwerp. And then in 1969, using that exact same technology, we are able to put a man on the moon. So we see how quickly science and engineering mixed together will create the world that we live in and how fast this is accelerating. Well, the atom is quite similar in that regard. And this is a simple atom. This is probably the atom we first saw when we were perhaps in grade school. And it only consists of three parts. It's a proton, a neutron, and a nucleus. Uh, of course, we know today that there are vastly more subatomic particles, mesons, neutrinos, antineutrinos, etc. So very simple atom. But the idea of the atom dates back to, I believe, the ancient Greeks, the, the, that the thought process was there, that this e existed. But nobody knows what it is. And how do you figure out what it is? Well, it, it's surprisingly not that long ago when we started to figure out what was going on with this thing that we take for granted. And the first one, uh, really, in 1904, when we start to get better models of, of atoms, and the electron has been discovered, and the electron is known to be a negative particle. Well, how do you have this negative particle when we know that the atom itself is neutral? Well, there's going to have to be a force that counteracts that negativity with a positive charge. And so we see here in this picture what is referred to as the J.J. Thompson atom of 1904 as the electrons are floating in a cloud of positive energy. That's the plus sign there. And so they're in this cloud of positive energy. And people describe this as the plum pudding atom. <laughs> The reason it's the plum pudding atom, because the electrons floating in this cloud remind people of plums floating in plum pudding. So that's why we get this first idea of an atom as late as 1904. Well, 
Then we get the Rutherford atom of 1911. And uh, some of you may know that Rutherford is considered to be the father of modern physics. Uh, he's uh, quite a great individual. I, I recommend, if you're interested in this topic, look up him. He's, he's kind of a pretty amazing guy. But he says, well, you know, we need to come up with some ideas of what's what an atom actually is. And he comes up with a very famous experiment. He's going to shoot alpha particles through a thin foil of gold. And he's, that is then going to go into what's known as a cloud chamber. So basically there's a glass globe that's filled with humidity, so it's a fog. And then you can see what's going on with these particles once they enter that fog. Now, at this time, in 1911, the way people actually do that is they stare at this globe. And they physically count move by move through that through that globe and you can only do this for about 20 minutes before your eyes go blurry and then you have to have somebody take your place but that's how basically i wouldn't say primitive but how simplistic these these experiments are well what happens and it's amazing to them is if the thompson atom was accurate then the alpha particles would just go straight through but some of these alpha particles are deflecting. And this is a very strange thing. Why would they be deflecting? And Rutherford describes it as, if well, if I took a cannon and I fired it at a piece of tissue paper, the vast majority of the shells would go right through, but occasionally one of these shells actually bounces back. So how could that be? And what they realize is that there must be a thing called a nucleus. So the nucleus has got to be inside that atom. And then with the mathematics from that little cloud chamber, they realize that the nucleus is incredibly small inside that atom, very small. Basically, uh, 100,000 times smaller. The equivalent of a simple atom, one grain of sand in the middle of a football field. Now, some atoms are bigger particularly uranium. So uranium, the nucleus of that atom, would be about the size of a marble. Going to be critical for as you go. But so that's the Rutherford atom. But there's a problem with the Rutherford atom. In classic physics, if something's spinning, like these electrons going around, they should run out of energy eventually. There's no such thing in classical phys physics as a perpetual motion machine. So what would happen then is they continue to spin and lose energy, then they would crash into eventually into the nucleus. Well, that's a problem, because if you think about it, we all exist. So there must be something wrong with classical physics. So Bohr, Niels Bohr, he will decide that there's got to be something here that these electrons can go into what's known as stationary orbits. But again, how would that work? They don't know. There's also, he's going to use Planck's quantum theory of radiation. Planck, previous to this, has already seen that there are issues with classic Newtonian physics. And he's going to reach out to a gentleman uh, named Werner Heisenberg. And Heisenberg is going to use something called quantum mechanics. In other words, we're going to look at physics in a statistical manner. Again, this, there must be, atoms must work because we exist. If that didn't work, then we wouldn't exist. So statistically, they're going to begin to analyze how the atom actually functions. And this is quantum mechanics. I always find it interesting that Albert Einstein doesn't really like quantum mechanics. <laughs> Albert Einstein always uses this phrase. He goes, God does not play dice. So he doesn't like the statistical aspects. But quantum mechanics is very useful in explaining uh, the world we live in, in effect. Well, now we need to find another particle. And that's going to be the neutron. And again, nobody knows that neutrons exist, 1932. And 
what happens is there's a group of people, uh, I will refer to them as the Jolie Currys. Uh, this is Madame Curry's daughter. And they're doing experiments. And they're seeing that protons are being ejected. And they come up with the idea that, well, the reason that these protons must be being ejected is because of gamma rays. Well, Chadwick says, I don't think that's right. You know, something that doesn't make sense. And he comes up with a simple experiment. He's going to take polonium source and he's going to aim it at a beryllium target. And then he's going to use that to hit a piece of paraffin wax, which begins to expel protons. Well, he decides, well, it can't be gamma rays because they don't have enough mass to displace something as heavy as a proton. So if it's going to displace this proton, what is it? It's, first of all, it has to be neutrally charged, and it must be heavy as a proton in order to move it. And, of course, then it has to have another factor that it is actually an integral part of the atom. So it becomes a, a subatomic particle. Not everybody agrees with this. They're like, mm, no, no, that's not right, Chadwick. But who comes to the rescue? Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg. And they come up with the fact that, indeed, this must be a subatomic particle, not a uh, proton-electron pair. So, again, these guys are critical in the development of early atom structure. Well, as, as you know by now, I like strange pictures in my uh, uh, presentations. And this is Rutherford's laboratory. Now... When we, when I look at Rutherford's laboratory, it doesn't strike me as any laboratory I would see today. Of course, there's no computers, and there's all this stuff, okay? And the reason there's all this stuff, these wires and jars and all these things, is Rutherford is what's known as an experimentalist. He's not a theorist. Well, he's a theorist, too, but he's he's more of what's known as an experimentalist. And he basically thinks up experiments and then literally physically makes the materials he needs in order to conduct these experiments. So in order to be Rutherford, you need to be able to know, for example, how to blow glass. You need So he's basically a craftsman, too, besides being a physicist. Now, if you've seen the movie Oppenheimer, you see early in the movie that Oppenheimer's in England, and he's working at a little desk, and he knocks over some plates and glass and makes a mess okay and he's punished for that he's not a he is not an experimentalist he's a theorist but people had to do things like this to in order to get these experiments done they couldn't go to the store and just buy things so and the other thing that's amazing to me and i, I just throw this in is the quantities of stuff they're using here like like i said he had he used polonium for example it's not like he's got a pound of this stuff, okay? No, he's got a microscopic quantity of these things. So these people are working in very, very primitive conditions. I use that word, probably not the greatest, but very simple way to do things. But they're doing things with incredibly small amounts of stuff as well. So it, to me, it's amazing that you could do these things with this type of equipment. Uh, and And they certainly do. Well, 1938 comes along, and something very strange happens. Otto Hahn and Strassmann, they decide, well, we're going to shoot some neutrons at a chunk of uranium. And they're at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin. And they shoot this, and, and what happens is they get a little minute quantity of barium. Well, how could that be? That doesn't make sense. And then there's Lisa Meitner and her nephew, Otto Frisch, and they are both Jewish. And they have escaped from Nazi Germany, and they have gone to Sweden. And it, it's kind of a sad tale as far as Lisa Meitner. She had to abandon all her possessions. Uh, she cannot get a job because nobody's hiring women physicists at this time. Uh, and she's basically kind of down and out 
living in Sweden. Uh, and she had spent her earlier part of her career working directly with Otto Hahn. They were very close partners. There was no relationship there than, of course, uh, business. Uh, they were, you know, very, they kept very separate about it because, again, they didn't really want women functioning in physics. So basically, Lisa Meitner actually worked in the basement. But she knows what's going on here, and she interprets this as, well, somehow that that atom must have split. It must have gone into two different things because barium cannot be. It's it's forty percent less mass of its of on the periodic table than uranium. So of course uranium is radioactive, and of course it will slowly begin to. Uh, have a half-life and, and begin to translate into something else. But that's incredibly slow, but this has happened like really fast. And how, how could that be? And Arl Frisch says, well, you know, Han just made a mistake. It's not a problem. You know, I mean, he, he just, he screwed it up. And, you know, this couldn't be. And she said, no, I worked with Han for years and he's way too good of a chemist to have made that type of a mistake. And so they decide that something must have happened to split that atom of uranium. And the way that really works is how they could, they begin to think how this could be. And the idea is they see it as a, as a big wad. The, the, remember, the uranium nucleus is the largest of any thing on the periodic table. It's the largest naturally occurring element in nature. And because it's so big, and so it's perhaps kind of wobbly. And they think about it like a drop of water. Well, a drop of water, though, it doesn't separate because of surface tension. Well, it's known at this time that electrical charge can overcome surface tension. And because that nucleus of that uranium atom is so large it has a more electrical power it also has the it's it's also unstable it's radioactive and they find out that perhaps this is a way that they can counteract that surface tension with and it'll actually accept a neutron and when it accepts a neutron that becomes so unstable that at that point it will divide well, that's a problem, too, because, well, if it divides, what's going to happen with it, which we'll see. But they, they have to come up with a term for this because the term hasn't been invented. And Frisch goes, well, it's kind of like a single cell animal. When it divides, it fissions. And so Frisch is actually the man who coins the term nuclear fission because of the idea that this is an unstable drop of water. Well, there's also a gentleman, uh, a Hungarian. There's a lot of Hungarians, by the way. They call him the men from Mars. And uh, his name is Leo Zillard. And he also appears in the movie as well. And he's residing in the United States. And he starts thinking about this going, well, maybe if these... If you have this fission of uranium, perhaps it will send out more than one neutron, and those neutrons will then hit another uranium uh, nucleus and split again, and this could become a chain reaction. And so if you can get greater than one neutron splitting, then this is a possibility that indeed you will get nuclear fission and a, a sustained reaction. So that would be known as a critical mass. That is the smallest amount that you need to get things to become self-sustaining. Look at it that way. And so they really work on this. And he decides that, you know, and he's actually thought about this before, but the idea is, is this could do two things. It's, it's going to release a great amount of power because that nucleus is held together, very, very powerful, what holds that nucleus together. If you can get that nucleus to divide, then it will release 
immense amount of power. So much so that it's believed at this time that if you could split one atom, it would be enough power would be released to move a grain of sand. Not everybody believes that, but that's the thought process at the time. And so what can you do with this? You could either make electrical power, you could generate heat, or you could perhaps make a bomb. Well, Zillard has been thinking about this for quite some time. And uh, he actually has a patent with the British government in 1934 for using, if you could split a nucleus and using this power perhaps to uh, use to drive a ship or perhaps to do something else with. But he actually has a secret patent dating all the way back to 1934 with this idea. But what happens is, is this is not particularly easy to do. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of problems with trying to get this to work. And there's, there's probably ought to look at the fact that there's two different types of isotope within uranium. There's more, but there's two major ones. And the two major pieces of uranium are U-235 and U-238. So the difference is three neutrons. They have 92 protons. 235 is 130, excuse me, 143 electrons or neutrons, 143 neutrons, and the uh, U-238 has 146. So also notice that U-235 is an odd number, which is important as well. Because what's going to happen is, is if you're going to create this type of reaction, you need to prevent the neutrons from going too much into the U-238. So you need to slow the neutrons down. And the way we can look at that is this. If I've got a, a ball of Play-Doh, a big ball, that represents the nucleus of an atom, and I have a little bitty ball of Play-Doh, and I throw that at that ball really fast, what's going to happen most likely is it's going to bounce off. It's not going to stick. Now, if I slow down, it's more likely to attach. When that attaches, of course, that's going to make that nucleus unstable most of the time. So the difference is, is 238 will not accept slow neutrons as easily as, as U-235. Another key piece is U-238, it will fission, but it will not sustain a reaction. It's a, The uh, neutrons it expels basically aren't powerful enough to, to do anything with. So you nearly need, in order to get a reaction, you need to get U-235. Now, there's another problem with U-235, though, is it's a very, very small portion within uh, uh, uranium. And how did they come up with this fact that, that you have this idea, oh, one other thing I neglected. If you build something to expel these, if you get this reaction going, this what will happen to occasionally is some of those neutrons will attach to U-238 and will create a new element called PU-239, and that's plutonium. So by using slow neutrons and creating what will be seen as a reactor, you can begin to create this other new element that doesn't exist naturally in, in, in the world. And 239 is going to be very, very effective for, for usage as far as being able to sustain a reaction to reach critical mass, just like U-235. So how do they come up with this? And it, it's, it's one of those strange quirks. There's a, a famous physicist, you may have heard of him, Enrico Fermi. And Enrico Fermi is at this time, he's working in Italy. And he's working on recreating these experiments that Hans Strassmann have done. And he gets completely different results. And he, he get, and sometimes he gets the right result. And sometimes he doesn't get the right result. It goes back and forth. He doesn't understand why this is going on. And he realizes then that he gets a positive result when he uses one type of table, which is wood, and he use, gets a different result when he uses another type of table that's made out of marble. And somehow he manages to realize 
that it's the tables that are slowing the neutrons down. Now, to me, that's a, I don't think I would ever make that leap of faith, but 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 he does, and uh, so he is critical in what's going to be known as building the first nuclear reactor. Now, I said he's in Italy. He's going to come to the United States. He's basically going to escape from Italy because his wife is Jewish. And he needs to get her to safety because he's afraid that the Italian government is getting more and more in line with Hitler at this time and being anti-Jewish. So he escapes. He's already a Nobel physicist, by the way. Uh, he's got the Nobel Prize. And he escapes and he goes to the United States and he goes to the University of Chicago. But what's come to realize here is that because U-235 and plutonium will accept both fast and slow neutrons, that if you get purified versions of these items, you can create not just nuclear power, but you can create a nuclear bomb as well. And that brings us to the University of Chicago in 1942. And in 1942, Fermi and Zillard are working on this thing, as you can see in this picture. This is going to be the first nuclear reactor. It is very, very large. And how this is going to function is simply this. They don't have pure uranium. So they're going to actually use uranium ore. Now, uranium ore has 99.3% is U-238, and 0.7% is U-235. Only U-235 will sustain a reaction. So they need, they take this, they take actually ore, which isn't even pure uranium metal, and they start filling it in canisters, and they need a lot of this stuff. I mean, a lot. And they're, they're constantly filling canisters, and then they need something to slow those neutrons down so it will be more effective for the U-235. And there's two items at this time that are well known to be used for this. One is uh, what's known as heavy water, which is a deuterium product. And that heavy water is primarily produced at a place called Norsk Hydro in Norway, which by 1940, of course, is occupied by the Nazis. So they can't really use that in 42. They also decide, well, we could use graphite. And the idea is there, they're gonna use graphite but this graphite has to be very, very pure because graphite frequently contains boron and that boron will capture neutrons, which is the last thing they want to do. So they're starting to build this thing and they've got all these canisters of uranium ore. And then they've got all these blocks of, uh, of uh, graphite and they have rods they put in. Now, the idea of the rods is that they will absorb neutrons. So you put the rod in, it absorbs neutrons, it keeps this thing from reaching critical mass. You pull the rods out, it begins to reach critical mass. So this is a control system. They call them control rods. Well, so they're building this thing underneath a, uh, in a handball court, underneath the grandstands of the football stadium at the University of Chicago. And they've got a bunch of students and other people trying to build this thing. And I don't know if anybody here ever worked with graphite. I know I use it to lubricate key locks. Well, graphite's really nasty. It gets you makes your hands black. It's just disgusting to work with, really. And they're using giant blocks of this stuff and tons of it. And 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 it's really a mess, okay? And so they're using all this stuff. And Fermi begins to refer to this thing not as a nuclear reactor, but as a nuclear pile or just a pile. And that is not a term of endearment by Enrico Fermi. Because it's disgusting to work with this stuff. Now, another interesting thing that happens with this to explain the difference between experimentalists and theoreticians is Zillard is there. And Zillard's like, you know, I don't really want to get my hands dirty doing this. So, I, you know, I got important thinking to do. I can't be bothered with this. And Fermi doesn't take that well. And so actually, after they get this thing to work, Fermi never wants to work with Zillard again because Zillard doesn't want to get dirty. So uh, it's, it's pretty strange how that works out. Well, 
Reactors today, when we look at a reactor today, what we will do is we will take U-235 and boost that up beyond 0.7%. And so they'll use slightly enriched uranium, about 5 to 20% U-235 compared to 0.7%. And that makes these reactors much more effective. But this time, the only thing they really want to do with these reactors is to make plutonium. And that's they realize that they need to make petroleum or petroleum, plutonium, uh, and that would be the only really effective use for these things because they can't be used as a bomb. Now we know today that, for example, when you look at Chernobyl, that reactors can uh, melt down and then it will emit a large amount of radiation and it causes a lot of problem. But to use this thing as a weapon, you'd have to put it on a ship and sail the ship into the enemy's harbor and then pull the rods out and wait for it to melt down, which isn't a particularly effective weapon. But it could be, and it was thought to be actually used in that manner, that it was thinking that this might work, but they basically decide no. But what they are going to do is they're going to use these things to create plutonium. Now, there's a key thing about plutonium. U-238 and U-235 are chemically identical. You cannot separate them chemically. This is a huge problem. Plutonium, on the other hand, can be separated from U-238 chemically, and that makes it much, much easier to work with. It also is because it's an odd number, that's another piece. The reason it's an odd number is it's more likely to accept a neutron because there's a, a gap there, basically, in the in that uranium atom. So look at it that way. It's more likely to take that hit and absorb it. And so 235 and plutonium will accept both fast and slow neutrons. So that's why they're vastly more effective. And then they can, of course, sustain a... a, a they reach critical mass and sustain fission. Well, so 235 can be used to create the simplest type of bomb, which we see here is the little boy casing. And the idea is, is you can smash these things together quickly and they will release their neutrons. If you can contain that pretty well, then indeed you will get an explosion. But it, it's the key ingredient, but there's it's very, very difficult to know how much they actually needed of this product. Again, nobody knows what's going on here. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's so basic. I mean, you know, their knowledge, I mean, they didn't even know what an atom was a few years previously. And so they're thinking, well, maybe we're going to need like a ton of this stuff, Okay. And, you know, maybe it's when it, we, it does explode, it's not going to explode that much more than chemical reaction. Well, the British, because, again, they've been working with Zillard and have been thinking about this longer, they have a, a group that they call Tube Alloys. And Tube Alloys is their version of the Manhattan Project. And they begin to do experiments, and they start to realize that, you know, yeah, you kind of need a lot of U-235 to do this, but you don't need tons of it. And, oh, by the way, that nucleus is held together really strong, and if we can split that, it's going to release a lot of power. But the problem, again, is going to be how do you separate 238 from 235? That's a huge problem. Can't use chemicals. And Bohr gets involved at this time, and Bohr says, well, you know, yeah, you could probably do this, but you'd have to make a factory that's about the size of an entire country. It's it's just not going to be practical. Well, there is one country in the world that will be able to invest in trying to do something in this, and that, of course, is the United States. And the United States will build three huge factories, this one being the largest factory in the world in 1944, which is known as K-25, and that's in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And so we got to separate these two. And they're not easily separated. How are we going to do that? Well, today we would use centrifuges for partial, part of this program. Centrifuges at this time are not capable of doing this. What they are going to do is they're going to try to do three different things. They're going to try to do gaseous diffusion. 
And gaseous diffusion is they're going to create a, a gas of uranium. They're going to try to push that through a very, very, very fine filter that can differentiate between three neutrons. So there's not a lot of difference there for this filter. And they're going to try to push this gas through and continue to push it through and over and over and over again. So when we look at K25, the largest plant in the world, that plant is just there to do gaseous diffusion. That's how hard this is. And oh, by the way, that gas is really corrosive, so it's really tough on those filters. So that's a problem. The next idea they're going to try is called liquid thermal diffusion. And liquid thermal diffusion is simply where you have the lighter element, the 235, is going to be more attracted to heat than the heavier element, 238. And you're going to try to separate it that way. The third way they're going to try to do this is thing, using a thing called a calutron, uh, which is a modification of a cyclotron. Uh, the cyclotron is created by Ernest Lawrence, who's also in the movie. And... Uh, Lawrence is working on this project, and he's trying to figure out how they're going to separate these things. And he's going to try to use a, a calutron, which is basically, and I'll show a picture of this, it's basically a cyclotron that's been uh, modified. And the way a cyclotron works is they use electric, electric magnets, electromagnets, to get these atoms spinning as fast as they can. And they need a lot of electromagnets to do this. So they need 6,000 tons of copper in order to make all the windings. Well, copper is very critical for the war effort. So they decide, well, maybe we should use something else. And they decide, well, you know, silver bullion would work. <laughs> so they go to the reserve, uh, the bullion reserve, and they go to the head of that. And they said, you know, we can't tell you why. But we would like 6,000 tons of silver. And he goes, young man, we do not issue silver in tons. We only issue silver in troy ounces. So they issue 6,000 tons of silver in troy ounces for the war effort. Of course, after the war, they take all these windings apart and replace them with copper and return the vast majority of that silver, of course, by the troy ounce. So, what is a calutron doing? And we can see a simple idea of what a calutron is. We're spinning those atoms. The heavier, the 238 atom will stay on the outside. The lighter 235 atom will stay on the inside. It'll be on a more uh, severe arc. So, those two pieces spinning will help them. And then what he's got there, if you see closely, he's got a collector. So that collector is collecting the atoms that are spinning at the lower arc, the 235 atoms. So they're literally developing this thing atom by atom. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty incredible that you're doing this. And none of these pro procedures works very well. None of them is very effective. So what they do, is they begin to take product from the gaseous diffusion, and then they use the liquid thermal diffusion to make it a little bit stronger. And then finally, they feed this into the calutron. And the calutron will then get them close to what's known as weapons-grade uranium. Weapons-grade uranium is roughly 80 or 90% uranium that is pure U-235. That's weapons-grade. Well... In order to get weapons grade of using these techniques and using the calutron, the maximum production for uh, per, is seven ounces per day. That's all they get. Now, this is the largest factory in the world. You're getting seven ounces per day. So in order to make one bomb, it takes 322 days to make one U-235 bomb. And they realize that this is not such a great idea uh, it would be much better to use this product to beef up the reactors and make plutonium, which can be chemically separated, much easier process. And that's what they're going to do. But it always strikes me this. Now, I work here. I go to work in the morning. I get any of these giant plants, and I work all day, and I get done with work, and I go home, and I think to myself, 
well, what the heck did we make? What do we make? I mean, you know, a year's production for all these plants is the size of a small suitcase. So I go to work at a regular plant, you know, a tank comes out every you know few minutes or a plane comes out and I see what's being made here. But here, these thousands of workers never actually see any results for what they're doing. So it, it, it's, it must have been very strange to work there on a daily basis and never see anything. Well, that brings us to the bombs themselves. And this is what's known as the little boy bomb. The little boy bomb is the U-235 bomb. It uses 141 pounds of U-235 in order to make one bomb. So basically, we just said that's 322 days of production to make U-235. This is not an efficient way to use this product. But this is the simplest bomb, and they're pretty much guaranteed that this bomb will work. Now, how does this actually function? Is if you look at the top of the picture, you can see that this is really a cannon inside a bomb. And what's going to happen is they're going to fire the explosive charge of the cannon. It's going to shoot that red block of U-235 like a shell into a smaller block of U-235 below it. Inside that smaller block is a thing called a initiator, which is basically a, a polonium and beryllium, I believe. Uh, and that is designed to squirt more neutrons. Because the idea is you need these neutrons to squirt as fast as possible to get before it expands itself, and then it stops the fission reaction. So you need this to be very, very quick. So they decide that they're going to make a cannon inside a bomb. And the British, the original uh, idea is that this thing needs a lot of muzzle velocity, and the way you get more muzzle velocity is making the cannon longer. And they figure they need a cannon about 17 feet long, which is pretty long for a bomb. And they said, well, you know, they still they do more calculations, et cetera, and they realize that they can make the bomb smaller. Now, the original bomb was called Thin Man. When they decide that they don't need the cannon to be that large, they refer to the, and by the way, the belief is that it's named after Franklin Roosevelt. Uh when they make it smaller, they decide they're going to call this bomb Little Boy. Well, so they reach out to the uh, United States Army Ordnance people and say, you know, hey, we need a cannon. Okay, they're okay, fine. Give us the specs. They give them the specs. Specs come back from the Army, and they're, man, this cannon is, like, really heavy. It's way too heavy. What's going on here? We don't need this thing this heavy. So they look at the specifications, and, of course, the Army builds cannon that can be used over and over again. This cannon's only going to fire one time because then it's going to vaporize. So they have to then go back to the drawing board and come up with a much lighter cannon that will be fitted into this bomb. So that's the simple bomb. The more difficult bomb is going to be Fat Man because there's a problem. They discover that plutonium will fission too quickly. It won't be able to sustain itself long enough to readily create an explosion, and it will actually be what's known in uh, technical terms, uh, as far as nuclear weapons go, as a fizzle. So, can't use a gun. And they had planned on using a gun, and now it's like, uh-oh, we can't use a gun. we got to come up with another idea. And what they're going to come up with is to use explosives as a uh, precision instrument. So we see a similar idea here. Now, this is different in that it's got a plutonium ball in the middle, and the plutonium ball weighs about 14 pounds. It's about the size of a small orange. And inside that ball is going to be, again, another one of those initiators, because, again, they need to squeeze out as many neutrons as they possibly can as quick as they can, because, again, it will disperse. So the idea is they're going to take explosives and use them to squeeze this thing down as fast as they possibly can. And that'll create, of course, a critical mass, and then the critical mass will create an explosion. Well, nobody's ever done this before. This is totally brand new. 
And what they're going to do is they're going to reach out to a, a gentleman, Chris Tukowski, which you may remember from the movie as well. He's the gentleman that bets Oppenheimer $10 uh, right before the Trinity test. And he's an expert on explosives. And he, for example, works on shape charges like the U.S. bazooka. And so he's there, and they need people to do these calculations. So Edward Teller, who is also featured in the movie, is asked to do these calculations. And Teller says, no, I don't want to be bothered with this. Uh, this is beneath me. This is for engineers. I want to build the thermonuclear bomb, or as he refers to it as the super. I don't want to be bothered with this. So they reach out to another gentleman to take his place. That gentleman is Klaus Fuchs. And he was a German that has escaped to England. He's part of the English contingent at Los Alamos. And he begins to do these calculations. Well, of course, Klaus Fuchs is a Soviet spy. So we have put a Soviet spy directly in the most critical part of the most feasible, usable bomb. And he will work on these calculations. Also, they'll bring in, uh, for example, some of you may remember IBM punch cards. Uh, they will also use these IBM machines to run all these calculations. And what they're doing is they're taking a pipe. And they decide that if they can find an explosive, they can set the explosive so it'll squeeze that pipe together without rupturing it, that they can then expand that to a 360-degree explosion. And indeed, that will be what they need to create that fusion ex explosion, or ex fission explosion, excuse me. So the reason it's called the fat man is because the large circle of explosives create the shape of the bomb to be in this way, and that's theoretically believed to be named after Winston Churchill. But that's the, but that's the idea of, of why that's so round, okay? Now, the fission, the 235 bomb, Using 141 pounds of, of U-235, which is mighty hard to come by, only fissions about two pounds. And of that two pounds, that releases roughly 15,000 tons of TNT explosive power. This bomb, using the 14-pound uh, uh, plutonium center, not all of that fissions either. But this bomb will ex uh, explode at about 20,000 tons of explosive. These are very, very primitive weapons by today's standards. But that's basically how they work. Well, how does this all come about? And it's simply this, is that there's a fear that the Germans will be the first to create this type of a weapon. And there are a lot of non-Jewish physicists, top-rated people that are still in Germany. For example, Hahn, Strassmann, Heisenberg, Wiseacre, three of these guys are Nobel Prize winners. And you've seen the, the Hahn and Strassmann and Heisenberg have all been involved in this right from the first. And so it's not that they don't have the brain power uh, in Germany to create this type of Westman. And all these Jewish people, these physicists that have escaped, they are terrified of this they're like whoa man if the nazis get the bomb first this is going to be really bad because they're going to win the war and zillard then in early 39 reaches out to other people that aren't in the united states he reaches out for example to fermi and he reaches out to the jolie curries and says please don't publish any more information about this this needs to be swept under the rug right now because we don't need people building these weapons, particularly the Germans. Well, Fermi has agrees to this, and Fermi, of course, is going to escape. The Jolie Curries are not. And, and the Jolie Curries are interesting to me that they're always like right on the cusp of, of a great breakthrough, or, and they'll just slightly misinterpret the data, or they'll They'll publish their paper a couple of weeks behind someone else that publishes the same results. And so they're always just, just missing from getting that Nobel Prize that they want. And so they decide, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna publish because they have were the first to publish that when you have fission, 
that U-235, for example, will emit more than one neutron. They see it as three neutrons. It's probably more like about 2.7. But regardless, they published this in Nature uh, in April of 39. So now certainly the cat's out of the bag as far as the ability to perhaps make this type of weapon. And Ziller then reaches out to Einstein. They're actually friends. And Einstein is in the United States. He's the world's most famous physicist. And he gets Einstein to write a paper to President Roosevelt. And they send this letter, and Roosevelt reads it. And, yeah, this is kind of interesting. And he says, well, maybe we should look into this. And he sends a group of military folks to go interview some of these uh, physicists, Wigner, uh, Zillard, et cetera. And they meet, and they're having this meeting about, and the, and the U.S. is gearing up for World War II at this time. So they're not particularly interested in spending this much effort into something like this. This is very speculative at best. So the, the military is kind of like, eh, you know, they finally come and say, well, what do you guys, what do you physicists need? What do you think this is going to cost? And I believe it's Wigner that goes, well, you know, we could get started for about $6,000. <laughs> and they're like, well, okay, $6,000, that's not a problem. We can do that. And so they leave the meeting. And of course, the other physicists there are basically, what are you, idiot? You know, we can't possibly do this for $6,000. What are you talking about? So to put it simply, the United States effort to build this weapon gets off to a mighty slow start, okay? And so it, this is 1940, where you don't really start doing anything serious until early of 42. And thanks, that's part, particularly thanks to uh, the British and their tube alloys program. So we see that that's really how the United States finally gets involved in building this weapon. Well, that brings us to the movie Oppenheimer. And we're going to do this, how this is going to hopefully work. I, I never know, but uh, we'll do this. I'm going to make a, a, a continue to have a small presentation. I'm going to talk about some of the main characters. Then hopefully we're going to have a plenty of time to have a discussion. I would like to open that discussion up as well to the folks on Zoom. So when we open that discussion up, what I would hope you would do is that if you have a question, take yourself off mute and ask your question. If you are not asking a question, please leave yourself on mute so we don't get a lot of distracting noises. And of course, it's open to you folks as well, but I wanted to really include the Zoom people on this as well. So just my opinion, uh, I think this is an excellent movie. I, I think if you have, and by the way, how many people here have seen the movie? Oh, we've got a lot of them. Good. Well, if you haven't seen the movie, I'd highly recommend it. And uh, I would say, and uh, one of the authors of the book, it's based on American Prometheus, says that it's has no major historical inaccuracies. So the so the movie itself is, I think, is very close to as close as you can get in a Hollywood movie to to being a good representation of reality. So with that all said, let us start with this, and let's talk about. The main character. The main character is Robert Oppenheimer. Uh, he is uh, born in 1904 to an extremely wealthy Jewish family. Uh, for example, his parents, when he's a teenager, buy him a 28-foot sailboat. I mean, my parents didn't buy me a 28-foot sailboat. I don't know about you guys, but I didn't get that. Even after the losing a a tremendous amount of their total fortune. When his father passes away in 1937, he still leaves Robert and his brother Frank an inheritance of, in today's money, about $8 million. So these people are not hurting. Okay. He does not go to a regular school. He goes to a very, very it's 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 Jewish in a sense, but it's 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 much more secular and extremely liberal. So he goes to this school, and I think this school really sets him off on a case uh, where he wants to be socially responsible. And also, he's a very, very special student. I mean, everybody's amazed at what he's capable of doing. So he's not your average guy, okay? 
he's also a bit of a patrician too, because again, he comes from a lot of money. And he contributes to science, particularly in the 30s. And he comes up with the theory of neutron stars, black holes, quantum field theory, and interactions of cosmic rays. Now, in the movie, they make much about the black hole piece. Uh, first of all, at that time, no one would refer to it as a black hole. That's That would not be the case. Most likely, his biggest contribution to science at this time is his work with neutron stars. But everybody in a movie understands black holes, so they make a big deal out of that. Realistically, at this time, he saw black the idea of a black hole as being more of a mathematical curiosity. So, again, but it's a movie. So, uh, and he he really never completes things. Uh, he'll have idea and he'll basically, you know, particularly with the students, he'll pass it on to someone else and, and that person will go on and take that idea and develop it and then will win a Nobel Prize. He doesn't win a Nobel Prize. Okay, he never, because he never really finishes stuff, but he's really good at giving people ideas and then helping them to achieve those ideas. And I think he's partially a, a polymath. In other words, he's good at a lot of things, uh, make it simply, and uses those to create things as well. But he, again, he never finishes things. So for example, he's uh, heavily interested in psychiatry. He's heavily interested in Eastern religions. He learns how to read Sanskrit. I mean, He's a genius. There's no question of that. But he never has that focus in order to really make achievements that he would be recognized himself for. And he, I don't believe that he's ever really a communist. Uh, I don't. I, he certainly hangs around with communists. His wife's a communist. His brother and his sister-in-law are card-carrying communists. But like I said, he's got this education from this liberal responsibility and. You know, he does things that are considered kind of leftist, okay? You know, he's he's in favor of unionization, which at this time, and particularly in the McCarthy era, is viewed as a front for communism. Uh, he donates to the Spanish Civil War. He uh, also will donate to help Jewish scientists escape from Germany. So... He's involved with all these kind of leftist things, and he hangs around. A lot of his friends are communists, and and so he gets tainted by that, I would say. But as far as him being a communist himself, I don't really believe that. I, I really see him more as just an extreme liberal, if that when I use it that way. And you must remember this, too. It shouldn't be, it's not technically illegal to be a communist. Okay, what is illegal is to be a traitor. So if you support the Soviet Union and you're a spy, that's one thing. To be a member of the Communist Party is actually another. But he's turned off to the Soviets for a few reasons. Uh, one of the big reasons, I think, is the show trials of 37 uh, in the Soviet Union. He's very, very, very unhappy about the Nazi-Soviet Pact of 1939. And at that point, I think he's completely turned away from uh, looking at the Soviet Union as being a worker's paradise. So he's he's very turned off by that. And of course, by 42, he has absolutely nothing to do with the Communist Party. Um, but what makes him great is, like I said, is I think he can see the potential of certain people. He's able to steer them, to guide them, to give them ideas that they can then use to create great things. And I think that's why he is the key person to lead the scientist at Los Alamos. That brings us to the next person who's critical for us to build this bomb. Bomb would never have been built in time without this gentleman, and that is General Leslie Groves, who's also, of course, in the movie. Uh, he is the son of an army chaplain. He grows up on military bases. He always wants to go to West Point. He manages to get into West Point finally, and he graduates in 1918, right when the war, World War I has ended. He goes on to a really great career as, a, oh, by the way, he's fourth in his class. And uh, because he's so high in his class, people that graduate very high at West Point generally go into the Army Corps of Engineers. That's what he does. 
So he is an engineer. Uh, he is going to work in uh, various and sundry products in the 20s and early 30s. But when World War II is approaching the United States, we start building all these bases, you know, train bases and factories and all. We're trying to gear up for the war. And the idea of gearing up for the war, this isn't going particularly well. Uh, there's a lot of disorganization, and it's, it's getting to be a mess. And he's appointed to basically be a ramrod to get this thing done, to get it organized. And he will make decisions, spur-of-the-moment decisions, for millions of dollars, which in today's dollars are billions of dollars. And and he's almost always right. And he, he's, he, he only cares about getting things done. He doesn't care about how many toes he steps on. Uh, all he cares about is things are going to get done. He makes decisions, and he has an uncanny knack of being able to pick the best people for jobs. So he's got a lot of skill sets that are very, very useful. And when World War II starts for the United States, he wants to go to Europe uh, to a combat position. And they tell him, no, you're not going. No, nope. we're going to put you in charge of the Med, which is the Manhattan Engineering District, which is we know today as the Manhattan Project. And he's not happy about that. But he sees this as a way where he can become a way that he will help to win the war. And that will help his career. He is very career-oriented. And I, I use this quote uh, from Major General Kenneth D. Nichols. First General Groves is the biggest SOB I have ever worked for. He is most demanding. He is most critical. He's always a driver, never a praiser. He's abrasive, sarcastic. He disregards all normal organizational channels. If I had my to do my part of the atomic bomb project over again and had the privilege of picking my boss, I would pick General Groves. He's a bitch, okay? I mean, to put a blow away, okay? Now, you may remember if you saw the movie, General Kenneth D. Nichols. He's that little officer that's got the little round glasses, and he's he's kind of this kind of Weasley character. And he is the guy at the near the end of the movie when they're at the hearing that declares that Oppenheimer is definitely a communist and definitely a Soviet agent. So he is the guy that will get into the record uh, all this negativity about Oppenheimer. So Nichols isn't exactly a nice guy either. Well, that brings us to the villain, Louis Strauss. And Strauss is an incredibly successful businessman. Uh, yes, indeed, his family does own a wholesale shoe business. He's not a shoe salesman in a shoe store, okay, just so we know. But uh, he has to leave school to help his family business. He does. He's a successful businessman by the late 20s. As an investment banker, he has a salary of about a million dollars. So he's he's extremely successful, but never graduates from college. And he resents that quite a bit. Well, during World War I, he works with Herbert Hoover for relief in Belgium. Post-World War I, he goes to Poland, and he begins to work in Jewish organizations. He's Jewish. He's very religious. And he will begin to help Jewish organizations in Poland. He's there during the Polish-Soviet confrontation, and he begins to hate communism. He sees communism as incredibly evil. In 1925 or 26, he joins the Naval Reserves. So he's going to become a reserve officer. And he's... People really... Don't like Strauss, particularly, <laughs> put it bluntly. But he's going to get, in World War II, he wants to become an active duty naval officer. And the FBI says, no, no, we can't have that. You're, you're too involved with these Jewish organizations. Well, he's pretty rich, and he's got a lot of powerful friends, and he gets himself into the military. And he's, he has rapid promotions. 
One of the things he does is he creates the program, you may be familiar with it, E for Excellence for Work and War Plants. So he has a contribution, uh, but he manages to get himself promoted as a reservist, really, to Admiral. And he always wants to be referred to as Admiral. Uh, regular Navy people don't think that reservists are admirals okay they, they don't see it that way they think that he's a civilian and he's putting out a lot of errors by people be demanding that people call him admiral so he does another thing that's really important though and he's heavily involved with nuclear aspects uh, uh he for example early before the war has uh financed uh experiments for leo zillard he's a part of the atomic energy commission oh. And he decides that what they need to do is they need to find a way to use weather reporting B-29s to see if there's radioactivity or nuclear fallout in the atmosphere. And he tries to get this program started. Now, Oppenheimer and the other physicists don't think this is worthwhile. They think this isn't going to work. But he pushes this program through with the uh, Air Force. And amazing... They use one of his B-29s, a sniffer plane, they call it, to discover the first Russian explosion of an atomic weapon in 1949. He holds this against Oppenheimer a great deal. He believes that Oppenheimer opposed this program because Oppenheimer is a communist agent and was trying to protect the Soviet Union. He dislikes Oppenheimer for a lot of other reasons, too. Uh, he was perceived slights. You see that in the movie where, uh, you know, there's the hearing and uh, Oppenheimer basically makes fun of him. Uh, he doesn't like that Oppenheimer hangs around with communists. Uh, he doesn't like that Oppenheimer doesn't go to temple uh, because he's Jewish. And he certainly doesn't like all his extramarital affairs. Well, when Eisenhower becomes president, he's going to make, uh, he wants to make, Louis Strauss, head of the AEC. And Strauss says, I'll accept the job on one condition. And that condition is that Oppenheimer is no longer part of the General Advisory Council. The General Advisory Council is the council that recommends ideas to the AEC. These are the scientists that give them advice. And Eisenhower says, well, okay. Uh, he looks at uh, all the communist background for uh, uh, for Oppenheimer and says, okay. And he's the one uh, originally that suspends Oppenheimer's, Oppenheimer's clearance. Then, of course, there's going to be the hearing to restore that clearance, which is the big scenes with the, with the little room and, and all that's going on. So that is the reason that takes place, because Strauss doesn't want him as part of the General Advisory Council. And at the end of the movie, of course, we see the big scene where it's going to be the nomination for Strauss to become Eisenhower's Secretary of Commerce, to be on the, on the uh, cabinet. And we see this in the movie as being driven by the scientists. And indeed, the scientists do contribute to this, but it's not the only driver of why he's not made uh, Secretary of Commerce. For example, you know, his arrogance. His, uh, he makes a lot of enemies in the Democratic Party particularly. Remember, the, the Democrats are, are gaining power at this time. He's also involved with a, a scandalous piece uh, between the Tennessee Valley Authority and a power plant that's going to be built in Tennessee, which is a black eye for the Republicans as well. So there's a lot more going on than just the scientists uh, don't like Louis Strauss, why he doesn't get that committee. But the biggest, probably simplest way to put it is the Democrats are going to use this as a way to basically embarrass the Eisenhower administration, and they do. So again, a bit overplayed in the movie, but that's uh, something I thought needed to be explained. Well, these are the two key figures. And they both want to build the bomb before Germany can build this bomb. That's their main goal. They want to win the war. But they want to win the war that, for some of their own purposes as well. For example, 
Uh, I would say that both of them are incredibly uh, ambitious. Uh, Oppenheimer, when he becomes the most famous scientist in the world post-war, and he is advising the president, and he's on all these committees, and people want his opinion, and he's on Life magazine, he likes that. He very much likes that. Uh, and he's very, very pleased that this is his contribution to the world, and he's world famous. Uh, Groves, on the other hand, he wants to be Army Chief of Engineers. He wants to get a much, uh, basically be as high as he possibly can in the Army. That's his goal. And, for example, what's going to happen now with Groves is in 1948, he's given an evaluation by Eisenhower, who is in charge of the Army at this time. And Eisenhower says, well, you know, I get a lot of complaints about you uh, because, quite honestly, you're rude, arrogant, insensitive, and you have complete contempt for the rules. And you're overweight. But that wasn't part of the program. But the fact is, Groves realized he's never going to be promoted to Army Chief of Engineers. In fact, he realizes, of course, that his career is over. He'll never be given a position of responsibility that he has had at running the Manhattan Engineering District. And he resigns from the military. So basically, his career is destroyed by the methods he used to get this bomb built so quickly. Well, Oppenheimer is enjoying this uh, notoriety, and he likes to be on all these committees and and he's enjoying himself now again his main goal was to defeat the germans and then what happens next is we defeat the germans the bomb's not completed and the scientists at los alamos they think well we shouldn't bother building the bomb at this point there's no point because we were building this bomb to defeat germany and oppenheimer says oh no no, no. we need to continue to build this bomb because we need to use this bomb as a demonstration to the world that war is now so terrible that this will end war for in the future. There will never be another war again once we use this bomb. And, of course, how naive that is. Much like Nobel. Nobel said that, you know, the creation of dynamite would make war so terrible that that would end war, and then he creates the Nobel Peace Prize. So we see that same level of naivete, naivete, naivety, I'll get it out. Uh, and he also sees, though, that building that thermonuclear weapon is going to lead to even a bigger arms race between the Soviet Union and the United States. So he advises the AEC not to build thermonuclear weapon, the super. And... That is really going to cause him a lot of grief, of course, because that disagrees with what the military, what straws, what these people want. I just wanted to really mention this picture because there's one thing really cool about it is this is at Trinity right after they've fired off the bomb and their protection against nuclear fallout is to wear little booties. <laughs> That's going to come up in a later lecture, just so you know. So you may want to remember that, that people don't have a very particularly good idea at this time of fallout and radiation. But uh, it is it is uh, just humorous to me that that's somehow that's helping them. So that brings us to the book that this is this is the movie is created from uh, primarily, and it's called American Prometheus. And that's by uh, uh, Kai Bird and uh, uh, Sherwin. And saw an interview uh, with uh, Kai, Bird, Kai Bird talking about writing this book. And he has an interview with Oppenheimer's last secretary. And they're, they're walking to work together, Oppenheimer and the secretary. And Oppenheimer keeps muttering. And so finally she turns to him and says, well, what are you muttering about? And he goes, those poor little people. And she goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, we're going to drop the bomb on Hiroshima. And those poor little people, they're all going to be killed or be injured by this weapon. Now, they did more research, particularly Sherwin on this part, and realized that that is the same week when that conversation took place, that... Oppenheimer had met with the bombardiers for 
the 509th bomb group telling them what the optimum height was to detonate that bomb to get the maximum effect. So you have this complete difference here. On one hand, he's he wants to use this bomb, and on the other hand, he feels terrible that this bomb is going to be used. And then he writes this, I believe, in 1954. Oppenheimer does. The notion that the thermonuclear arms race was something that was in the interest of this country to avoid, if it could, was very clear to us in 1949 because we were infinitely more vulnerable, because more of the U.S. population lives in large cities than does the Soviet population, and infinitely less likely to initiate the use of these weapons. And because the world in which great destruction has been done in all civilized parts of the world is a harder world for Americans to live with than it is for the communists to live with. We thought of the U.S. decision to not build the thermonuclear would make it less likely that the Russians would attempt it. So he sees it uh, as, in that regard. And when we think about the world today, are we safer because the thermonuclear weapon has been built? Are, are we really? I mean, we think about this. Uh, he said in a movie, you can see the part where he says that, uh, you know, should they have dropped a thermonuclear in, in, on Hiroshima? And he says, that doesn't make sense. And they say, well, why doesn't that make sense? Maybe because the target's not large enough. So the creation of these bombs, when we look at it today, I see North Korea threatening us basically weekly that they're going to want to use bombs against us. We see Putin basically threatening the United States and NATO with these types of weapons. Yet at the same token, he's hiding behind this weapon so he can use conventional warfare. So how much safer have we become because of creating thermonuclear weapons? I would say not much at all. Yes, Avery. Uh, I had an entire class on college on the uh, development of the nuclear weapons uh, taught in the physics department. And my professor's opinion on this was that Oppenheimer was a naive fool. That the bomb, the, the hydrogen bomb was going to be developed. Could have been, yes. No, it was going to be because it was known to be possible by a lot of people. Same as the atomic weapon. Same as the atomic bomb. And he said the idea that Oppenheimer could prevent the development of this weapon for his opinion. And that the weapon was not going to be developed by major countries was just nuts. My point would be this. The advantage of using this weapon versus using the fission weapons that we already had is minuscule. There is no real difference there. The weapon is already available. So basically, this was not a useful weapon at all. It, people would describe it, quite honestly, as a weapon of genocide. That the, a, a, the quick piece... The idea with a thermonuclear bomb is that they can be made as large as you wish to make them. There's no limit to, to theoretically to the size of a, of, a, of a thermonuclear bomb you can make. You just give it more fuel, it becomes a bigger bomb. There is one problem with that, and Teller had said this. Uh, Teller had said, well, once you get to 100 megatons, what happens is it blows a hole in the atmosphere, and the bulk of the explosion then goes into outer space. So at 100 megatons, there's no reason to build a bomb any bigger. My point is to this is that there was no reason to build these, regardless if it could be built or not, which it can be built, obviously, that it didn't gain us anything, that the money we spent on this thing was basically did not give us any more security than we would have had otherwise using atomic weapons. That'd be my point feelings. Well, now, this comes to Byrd and Sherwin have tried for years to get this clearance over, over, overdone, to get it reestablished, re that they would get Oppenheimer's name cleared and he would have his security clearance back. They realize that's never going to happen because, quite honestly, he's been dead since 1967. And you can't reestablish it at that point. 
What they could try to do then is, after years of trying to do this, petitioning senators, presidents, et cetera, is they wanted to get it vacated. And they're going to get it vacated by this lady, Senator uh, uh, Jennifer M. Granholm, who is the secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy. And she is good. What she does is she has an advisor. Uh, his name is Subramanian, I believe. I've seen him on a C-SPAN show. And he is a lawyer, and he is going to look into the procedure that went on with this with this piece. And what he's going to come up with is he looks at all the records and sees that the AEC had indeed violated their own rules in order to railroad Oppenheimer. And he, he showed actually a memo that he had found. And remember that in the movie, and truthfully, is that Oppenheimer's lawyer and Oppenheimer didn't have security clearances. So they couldn't see the evidence that was going to be presented to them in advance. So they were constantly using this evidence to basically surprise them. And it says this right in this memo. The element of surprise must be maintained. And what's also interesting in this memo is there's a little written in CC to Louis Strauss. So Louis Strauss knew this was going on the whole time. And indeed is probably the orchestrated it. Again, nobody can be sure did he give the FBI information, et cetera. But that's, it's pretty much clear that the AEC violated its own rules. And then Bird writes this in an article in the New Yorker of July, 2023. In 1954, America's most celebrated scientist was falsely accused and publicly, publicly humiliated, sending a warning to all scientists not to engage in the political arena as public intellectuals. This was the real tragedy of the Oppenheimer case. What happened to him damaged our ability as a society to debate honestly about scientific theory. The very foundation of our modern world, Grand Holmes' courageous decision, has reaffirmed not only that the federal government is capable of correcting his mistakes, but that the government employees, regardless of their stature, can express opinions that challenge the conventional wisdom without fear that they will be falsely branded as disloyal. Realize that Granholm is in charge of Los Alamos. She's in charge of almost all of the major national laboratories. So we now see that she has made a statement to the people at these laboratories that if you make an opinion, if we ask your opinion, like the General Advisory Council, and we don't like your opinion, we're not going to punish for you for that in the future. And this basically liberates, in my opinion, uh, scientists today. Now, I have eight minutes. <laughs> Pretty fast. And so I'm going to open this up first, if we have anybody on Zoom that has a question. Maybe not. Well, yes, I do. And from Huntsville. Yes. The difference between Trinity site at White Sands, New Mexico and Trinity site, Los Alamos. Because I grew up in El Paso and we always heard about Trinity at White Sands. Well, uh, I would say that. The Trinity site at White Sands, uh, I'm not actually familiar with. Uh, the I, I believe the Trinity site at this point was actually in Alamogordo. Oh, okay. Well, well, White Sands is about seven miles from Alamogordo. Holloman Air Force Base has an Alamogordo address. Okay, that's what I need to know. Thank you for your answer. No problem. Thank you. Well, I don't remember anything called the Trinity site there. Well, the Trinity site, yeah, the Trinity site is, is actually not in Los Alamos directly. It's nearby. I think, what, it's like 75 miles or something. It's considerably south and east of it. Right. Near Alamos. Yeah, it's, I think it's about 75 miles, as I remember it. But uh, sure, go ahead, Bill, first. Uh, who appointed uh, Secretary Granholm, and what were her years of service? She's current. Well, she's there. Oh, this all happened. That 2022. I just figured he wrote that article. 
after the fact. Yeah. Right, yeah. She, she uh, before the movie came out in 2022, uh, she had uh, created, uh, she had basically vacated their findings. Yes, sir. Uh, after, well, I was in college with a former uh, soldier, Army, and we didn't, it, that picture where they showed him wearing a white boots or whatever to protect him. Yes. And he was involved. What the Army did was to uh, dig trenches around the test site and put soldiers in the trenches. And he was one of the soldiers that was in the trenches. And they wanted to see what would be the effect of the glass going over them in the trenches. And right. Was, that was uh, for uh, tactical weapons that we had developed. Uh, by the way, uh, Oppenheimer was actually in favor of creating tactical nuclear weapons, which I think is interesting as well. Uh, he didn't want to build the super, of course, but he, he thought that maybe tactical nuclear weapons would be uh, something worth building. Yes, sir. Uh, going back to the theory and practice of the uh, how the bomb works, uh -huh. back in the late 50s, early 60s, there was a show on TV called The Wonderful World of Disney. <laughs> they they had a demonstration. They had a, a, a basketball court filled with mouse traps, all loaded with ping pong balls. And they threw one ping pong ball out in the middle of it, and the reaction of everything going off was a demonstration of how a nuclear weapon works. Well, well, yeah, if you can get it to do that, yeah. Uh, I mean, you think of a, a, a basketball court filled solid with, with ping pong balls sitting on the mousetrap. How many times they have to redo it when somebody stepped on it? <laughs> obviously, obviously, Disney had a bigger budget than I yeah. do. So, uh, any other questions? Yes, Bill. Better uh, facets to uh, in case the ball in Batman. Uh, with those shapes, looks very close and not exactly like the pattern Buckminster Fuller used when he designed a bit uh, draw. I would assume there would be some sort of mathematical similarity, but I have no idea. I mean, really. Again, I'm not a mathematician or a scientist or a physicist or a chemist. Yes, Charlie. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg, in his autobiography, Secrets, he argues that. Uh, the Vietnam War, and with all due respect to any Vietnam veterans who are here, the Vietnam War was basically a war between nuclear superpowers who could not use their nuclear weapons. So they used Vietnam as sort of a, a proxy, uh, you know, a place where they could carry on war and get their aggression out without, you know, using nuclear weapons. And uh, so I, I, I throw that out just because, you know, nuclear weapons have sort of had a deterrent effect, I guess you could say. Uh, yeah, I would say there's no question that they have a deterrent effect. Yeah. Uh, from creating a, what me, my people would say a world war, but we see now that bad actors are hiding behind those weapons to, to have conventional war, which is one of the reasons we fought World War II uh, was to prevent that from occurring again. Yes? Uh, are you going to get into the delivery of the bomb and B-29? Oh, yeah! Well, one thing that's always been fascinating to me is that the, the cost of the, developing and, and operating the B-29 was more than the cost of uh, the nuclear installations to build it. Yeah, absolutely. Three and a half billion. Yeah, the number I hear is always two billion for the bomb, three billion for the B-29. Similar figure. Right. That is amazing when you look at the construction of, of the facilities, both in Tennessee and in Washington state. In other places, I mean, that's just phenomenal. We had a mighty big factory to build 29s in Kansas, too, though. Yeah. Yes, Avery. Um, look at the calculations of the cost of the bomb. Are you counting the power generation that was necessary to make these plants? I certainly couldn't answer that question. Had we not, had we not... That, was, that was actually an incredible part of what irritated people about Groves was that he had to build this monster infrastructure, including all the electricity. The power plants but to run that place, to, yes. To do the diffusion to start the uh, 235 process. Right, yes. Yeah. So certainly there was a lot of uh, 
power plants. They built a power plant just for uh, uh, the uh, the plants at uh, Los Angeles. <laughs> Oak Ridge. I get it. I finally spit it out. <laughs> Thank you. That during the development of Oak Ridge and the operation of Oak Ridge, had we not had the TVA, which had built dams during the Depression, and the dams that were built in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we we could not have developed. We would not have the electrical power to have developed those. The, to Avery's point, uh, Groves didn't think that was adequate in Tennessee and built another power plant. At one time, approximately. <laughs> Number of is that ten percent of all the electrical power in the United States was used to develop the uh, atomic bomb, and I will check that for next week. Feel free. I I, I would not be able. To, I don't have that number, so it was an incredible. Amount. It's an incredible amount. Well, look at six thousand tons of copper uh, winding was necessary. They used six thousand tons of silver. That's a lot of windings. Okay, that's a lot of electricity. Anybody else? Anything? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys.